Hello, Alison. How are you? I can see I can see you the, the screen. Okay. Very good. We're gonna go ahead and get started with the live streaming and we'll start in a second, but I can see you looks good and welcome Benjamin. Good to see you. Thank you for the invite. Hello, Professor Acuna. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program, US-Canada Hands Off Venezuela, No to Sanctions on Venezuela, Free Alex Saab. My name is Alison Bodine, and uh, I am the coordinator of the Fire This Time Venezuela Solidarity Campaign. And it is really my pleasure to invite you all to this monthly picket this evening. Bienvenido y bienvenidas todos y todes. Estamos aquí anoche a unir contra el bloqueo y sanciones criminales contra Venezuela y también a gritar por la libertad inmediatamente de nuestro Alex Saab. Um, vamos a empezar con uh, una explicación sobre el sistema de traducción simultánea de este webinar. En dos minutos vamos a comenzar con la uh, traducción simultánea. En sus controles de Zoom, haga clic en interpretación, es un icono de globo abajo. Um, haga clic en el idioma que le gustaría escuchar y es opcional, pero es una recomendación para escuchar solo el idioma interpretado. Haga clic en silenciar audio original, es una opción. Pero todas estas opciones están en el uh, globo, en el icono de globo abajo en, en tu computadora o teléfono. Y vamos a poner las instrucciones también en el chat. Um, for anyone participating tonight in English, uh, we will have simultaneous translation because some of our speakers will be speaking in Spanish. And so I encourage you to join interpretation. We'll start it in just one minute uh, by going to the bottom of your screen and clicking the globe icon. Uh, there is an option there to choose your language and then a further option, which is recommended, which is to silence the original audio and everything will be very clear for you here tonight. We'll go ahead and post those instructions in the chat as well. Thank you again for being here and just give us a second while we start the interpretation. Welcome again, everyone. Uh, as we start to join here into the monthly picket action tonight, I want to really thank everyone for joining us to demand uh, an end to US Canada sanctions and blockade against Venezuela and also freedom for Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab. This event is broadcast from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, the traditional and unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish Coast Salish Indigenous Nations. My name is Alison Bodine. I am the coordinator of the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, and author of Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Venezuela from Battle of Ideas Press. These actions are organized by the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg, the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, and Just Peace Advocates with the support of Venezuela Solidarity Organizations and individuals across Canada. And I am uh, glad to say that this is the 14th monthly picket action held consecutively. Now, of course, uh, we wish that we did not have to hold monthly actions demanding an end to these criminal attacks on Venezuela, um, but we are committed to maintain our solidarity with the people of Venezuela and our continued organizing in defense of Venezuela's sovereignty 
and self-determination uh, for as long as uh, we are have to. Today is a special picket in a lot of ways. We have a really excellent panel of speakers, but also 20 years ago, as of yesterday, on April 13th, 2002, the people of Venezuela defeated a US-backed right-wing coup attempt. After only two days, less than 48 hours, President Hugo Chavez returned as the rightfully elected president of Venezuela. Since then, the people of Venezuela and the Bolivarian revolutionary process have continued to stand strong against a nonstop campaign of destabilization and brutal sanctions against Venezuela carried out by the US government and their allies, including Canada. Every day, the people of Venezuela face shortages of goods, fuel, food, medicine, and daily necessities that are the result of inhuman, brutal, and heavy imperialist sanctions and blockade. These attacks on Venezuela include the unjust imprisonment of Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab, who was arrested while in Cape Verde en route to Iran to negotiate shipments of fuel and humanitarian supplies for Venezuela. Since being kidnapped by the United States government on October 16th, 2021, from Cape Verde, he has been held in jail in Miami, awaiting trial on trumped up charges of money laundering. And we'll have an update about his case from Venezuelan lawyer, Adriana Parada, tonight. We really are grateful for everyone that has joined to hear the updates on the case of Alex Saab, the campaign for his freedom, and also perspectives from the US and Canada, uh, organizers, activists, intellectuals who are taking a stand against these cruel US-led attacks. Tonight's picket is also being broadcast on Facebook. We'll put the link in the chat. You can share it with your uh, social media networks and encourage people to do so. And at the end, I wanna say as well, we'll invite everyone to turn on their cameras. You can't right now, um, but we'll take a group photo for those that would like to. You're encouraged to hold up a sign if you have one or a flag, or you can just uh, raise a peace sign or a fist and participate in a group photo to show our support for freedom for Alex Saab and an end to the blockade against Venezuela. Without further ado, I think we'll go ahead and get started with our program. We will start with Idriana Parada. She is a Venezuelan lawyer and a member of the movement for the liberation of Alex Saab in Venezuela, which has had a very um, you know, busy week so far this week, which we can hear a bit about uh, where they have taken some important steps to build the international campaign for his freedom. And also we'll have an update on a court case that took place in the US at the beginning of April about his case. Um, so again, uh, Idriana will be speaking in Spanish. So if you're listening and want to participate in English, you need to go to the bottom of your screen and enter the interpretation uh, by going to the globe. Thank you so much for joining us, Idriana. Despite a very um, busy schedule this week, um, we are really honored to have you here with us and to have your important perspective. Thank you. Hola, Alison. Un saludo. Un saludo a todos los compañeros de Canadá, de Estados Unidos, a Radica y a todos, al profesor Luis Acuña. Afectuoso saludo y a todos los compañeros que desde de diferentes partes del mundo eh, se mantienen en solidaridad con Venezuela en contra de las medidas coercitivas unilaterales impuestas a Venezuela y no solamente a Venezuela, más de 30 países, que es muy importante visibilizar esta ilegalidad, esta injusticia que solamente hace sufrir a los pueblos y que solamente viola la soberanía de los países eh, que tienen derecho a la autodeterminación. En efecto, Alison, eh, en el caso de nuestro diplomático Alex Saab, ya contamos el día de hoy con 671 días de secuestro, en donde, eh, lo reiterábamos, se le han violado eh, todos sus derechos humanos, se ha violado el debido proceso. Recordemos que estamos hablando de un diplomático debidamente acreditado desde el 9 de abril del año 2018. El 12 de junio del año 2020 fue ilegalmente 
eh, detenido, realmente fue secuestrado eh, en Cabo Verde, en, en, haciendo un poco, eh, tratando de complacer los caprichos de Estados Unidos y evidentemente violando lo que es los instrumentos internacionales como la Convención de Viena sobre Relaciones Diplomáticas. Recordemos entonces que eh, nuestro diplomático iba en una misión desde Venezuela hasta la República Islámica de Irán para la adquisición de alimentos, medicamentos, combustibles y es, es cuando es interceptado y es secuestrado y lo decimos así porque no existía ningún instrumento legal, no existía orden de detención, no, existi no existió notificación roja de Interpol, existió un día después y a, ahí en Cabo Verde transcurrieron no, 491 días de violación a sus derechos humanos, violación al debido proceso y violación al derecho internacional. Posteriormente, el 16 de octubre, es eh, víctima de un segundo secuestro cuando, bueno, eh, de manera ilegal, fue trasladado desde Cabo Verde hasta eh, Miami, hasta Florida, y es donde se encuentra en estos momentos recluido en una prisión del Distrito Sur de la Florida. El día 6 de abril eh, fue un día muy importante porque se llevó a cabo la audiencia, eh, de, eh, realmente es una audiencia en donde se estaba hablando sobre el recurso de apelación que interpuso la defensa en, ante el circuito undécimo de la Corte de Apelaciones de Georgia. Eh, sin embargo, el, el, este, este día 6 de abril, desde hace más de un año, está cursa este, este recurso de apelación y ya el día 6 de abril de ahorita de este año se pudo oír lo que fue los argumentos orales. Podemos decir que la defensa llevó un, una, un ejercicio legal impecable, se hizo una audiencia impecable en donde mm, se pudo demostrar que todos los documentos que acreditan a nuestro diplomático eran incontrovertibles. Eh, importantísimo que no, todos sepamos que lo, el panel de tres jueces le hizo una pregunta directa al fiscal de Estados Unidos si habían promovido algún tipo de documentos que contradijera los argumentos de la defensa y el propio fiscal que se encontraba en la audiencia eh, no, no negó esto. Simplemente dijeron que no pudieron eh, promover ningún tipo de documentos eh, ni evidencias que contradijeran el hecho de que Alex Saab es un diplomático debidamente acreditado por eh, la República Bolivariana de Venezuela como país soberano y en ejercicio de la autodeterminación y de su soberanía. De manera que quedó demostrado que los documentos que prueban su estatus diplomático desde el 9 de abril del año 2018 son legítimos. Y también quedó demostrado en esta audiencia, que es lo más importante, es que no se está discutiendo la legalidad de su nombramiento o no se está discutiendo su estatus diplomático, sino que se está eh, discutiendo en este caso, se pretende discutir, es eh, el ejercicio de soberanía de Venezuela como Estado. Eh, lamentablemente, los Estados Unidos, en una práctica de extraterritorialidad, está tratando de someter a prueba las decisiones del presidente legítimo de Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro. Y de manera que eh, podemos decir entonces que ahí quedó demostrado que estamos en presencia de una persecución política, quedó demostrado que no existen evidencias, que no existen argumentos para contradecir el ejercicio legítimo de Venezuela, que fue nombrar un enviado especial, nombrar un, un diplomático para que pudiera ejercer la representación de Venezuela y poder sortear poder evadir las medidas coercitivas unilaterales que estaban afectando a, to a toda la población de Venezuela. De este día esperamos que eh, Estados Unidos, eh, el, el Departamento de Justicia, haga respetar la ley, haga respetar más de 200 años de relaciones diplomáticas, haga respetar la Convención de Viena de 1961, en donde establece que todos los diplomáticos tienen derecho a o, o tienen, eh, están protegidos por una inmunidad. En el artículo 29 lo establece la Convención de Viena, así como se establece de manera clara que eh, los países tienen derecho a establecer relaciones bilaterales diplomáticas como en efecto lo hicieron Venezuela e Irán. 
se espera, Alison, que la decisión se emita alrededor de un mes. Sin embargo, a pesar de tener una audiencia impecable a nivel de defensa, debemos decir que, eh, o denunciar, que la intención de la Fiscalía, en este caso de Estados Unidos, no era desvirtuar su estatus diplomático. Pues es muy difícil eh, hacerlo ante una decisión de Venezuela. Lo que pretende la Fiscalía es que la Corte de Apelaciones no decida y devuelva el caso a Miami para que empiece nuevamente un proceso ante el juez Escola, quien es el que lleva el caso en el Distrito Sur de la Florida. Debemos recordar que este juez Escola es el mismo juez que eh, lo declaró prófugo de la justicia de manera ilegal y no quiso oír los argumentos de la defensa del por qué Alex Saab no debía ser llevado ante eh, la justicia, ante el sistema de justicia de, de Estados Unidos, debi debido a que es un diplomático en funciones y que estaba ejerciendo la, la representación de Venezuela. Eh, de manera que en esta audiencia es muy importante repetir, quedó demostrado que es un hecho incontrovertido que Alex Saab es diplomático, que fue debidamente acreditado desde el año 2018 y que estamos en presencia de una persecución política en donde los Estados Unidos pretende someter a prueba y pretende someter a discusión las decisiones del presidente legítimo, Nicolás Maduro. Nosotros como movimiento desde Venezuela vamos a seguir alzando la voz, elevando las denuncias, haciendo eh, seguimiento eh, paso a paso de todo lo que pueda ocurrir desde el punto de vista legal, eh, y desde el punto de vista de decisiones ante el, el circuito undécimo de la Corte de Apelaciones de Georgia y eh, debemos decir que vamos a estar en constantes acciones estos días, Alison como les decíamos, todos los 16 estamos elevando una etiqueta y eh, visibilizando la denuncia pues los, el, el 16, los 16 se cumplen meses de la, eh, del segundo secuestro de nuestro diplomático hacia los Estados Unidos. También es importante que eh, sepamos que eh, no solamente estamos esperando esta decisión en el circuito undécimo de Georgia, sino que también se están de manera paralela haciendo eh, la República Bolivariana de Venezuela ha eh, llevado adelante acciones diplomáticas ha llevado adelante acciones de denuncia, como fue un acuerdo recientemente que eh, emitió la Asamblea Nacional de Venezuela en respaldo del respeto por la inmunidad diplomática de nuestro enviado especial, nuestro diplomático Alex Saab. Nosotros desde Venezuela agradecemos a todos los movimientos de solidaridad, a todos los activistas eh, defensores de derechos humanos que se han sumado a la causa y que nos ayudan a nivel internacional a visibilizar este caso como un caso que viola todo el derecho internacional, viola las relaciones diplomáticas y recordemos que eh, la, la única organización internacional ante quienes en, en teoría pudiera someter algún tipo de, de emitir algún tipo de sanciones o algún tipo de evaluación es la Organización de las Naciones Unidas, la ONU y, no hay, y la única eh, pronunciamiento de ellos es que las medidas coercitivas unilaterales son ilegales y que todos los países tenemos derecho a la soberanía, todos los países tenemos derecho a la autodeterminación y estas acciones violan entonces de manera flagrante eh, la, la soberanía de Venezuela y la soberanía de los demás países. Con esto se pretende sentar un precedente eh, muy peligroso que pudiera llevarnos entonces a una situación de anarquía internacional, una situación de no respetar las relaciones diplomáticas y de no respetar la, eh, la figura de lo que es la inmunidad de los representantes de otros estados. Además, que pudiera tener un efecto boomerang en contra del propio Estados Unidos y en contra de los propios países que mantienen activamente enviados especiales y relaciones diplomáticas con otros estados. Desde Venezuela, a todos, muchísimas gracias. Free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab. Thank you. It is really great to have you here. 
Indriana to explain to us kind of what the next steps are and um, also the strength of the growing campaign. We can see if you look on social media, uh, people in Venezuela mobilized for the freedom of Alex Saab. And we have to, as people living in the belly of the beast in the US and Canada, really uh, recognize that and learn from that and also bring this important case of Alex Saab to our communities here in the United States and Canada, because uh, the case of Alex Saab is not only about Alex Saab or about the people of Venezuela, it's a fundamental attack on the right of countries to have independent foreign relations, to be able to uh, provide for their citizens and for, for the people that live in their country, the fundamental uh, human rights to food and, and water and uh, medical supplies, all these things that the US government is trying to prevent. And also just the, the, um, the violations of international law that have been carried out by the United States. So uh, thank you again for joining with us. Um, to give people a bit of an idea of what it's been like in Venezuela the last few days, so we'll play the videos uh, now. Um, the first is going to be a Telesur report uh, from a march that happened yesterday commemorating 20 years since the uh, defeat of the US-backed coup against uh, President Hugo Chavez. And then also there'll be a song uh, that is dedicated to the this defeat of the coup by the people of Venezuela, um, by Jovis Nando Cantos, a, uh, which I think many would probably recognize it's a beautiful song and has some great images with us. So let's go ahead and uh, do that now. a conmemorar los 20 años del golpe de Estado contra el presidente Chávez y la restitución del hilo constitucional. Nuestro corresponsal, Leonel Retamal, nos trae el siguiente reportaje. Miles de personas llegaron hasta las inmediaciones del Palacio de Miraflores. Son trabajadores, movimientos sociales, organizaciones políticas y milicianos comprometidos con la revolución bolivariana. Esta es la masiva movilización que acompaña la conmemoración de los 20 años del golpe de Estado en Venezuela. Pero también, y más importante aún, el día de hoy, 13 de abril, hace 20 años atrás, este pueblo venezolano logró revertir un golpe de Estado contra el presidente de la época, el comandante Hugo Chávez. Son 20 años de lucha y muchas batallas por mantener el modelo político. Todas las batallas que siempre nos han querido enfrentar, siempre las hemos derrotado, gracias a Dios y a este pueblo heroico y soberano que no nos dejamos caer con ninguno de ellos que quieran sabotear todo. El 11 de abril nos dieron un golpe de Estado, gracias al pueblo venezolano logramos rescatar a nuestro comandante Chávez y seguir el proceso revolucionario. Hemos resistido muchos ataques del imperio norteamericano, de algunos países eh, que se han arrastrado pues, al imperio. Los recuerdos son vívidos y también las emociones de aquella época. Lo revisan con nostalgia, pero a la vez como legado hacia el futuro. 20 años atrás de resistencia, de permanencia, de lucha constante a un legado, a un comandante que nos dio eh, una esperanza, una esperanza de seguir. De verdad, el comandante Chávez para nosotros es nuestro comandante eterno y seguirá siendo aún más allá de la muerte. El pueblo salió a la calle a defender a nuestro comandante Chávez cuando lo tenían secuestrado y aprendieron lo que es la revolución, lo que es el humanismo, el amor por nuestros venezolanos, unos entre otros. El presidente Nicolás Maduro señaló en su discurso que siempre se ha subestimado al pueblo venezolano. Por eso los adversarios de la revolución se han equivocado constantemente. Y nos han subestimado con las medidas coercitivas, el bloqueo económico que nos han hecho. Nosotros nos hemos constituido en diferentes formas de organización para garantizar la producción y la productividad del país. Hoy tenemos una patria soberana. Los recursos que hoy producimos los producimos los venezolanos y las venezolanas sin apoyo de ningún imperio. Y por eso nunca se nos olvidará que después de ese 11 vino este 13 y que a nadie se le olvide que este pueblo viene marchando en pro de su libertad. Ya está bueno de sanciones, ya está bueno de que nos sigan matando aquí porque ellos le da la perra gana. Que hay un pueblo que aquí está, la demostración absoluta que lo que queremos es paz, pero también si nos buscan nos consigue y es que está el pueblo. También se conmemora los 13 años de la milicia bolivariana. Este quinto componente de la Fuerza Armada Nacional Bolivariana proviene de uno de los aprendizajes de aquellos tiempos. La unidad cívico-militar, hoy por hoy, uno de los pilares del proceso. Leonel Retamal, Telesur Caracas, Venezuela.
volveremos, no jodas. Que no nos hemos ido. La gente no se la va a calar. Jamás se la va a calar. Con su bandera y su conciencia, bajaron a defender su voluntad, bajaron contra el fascista y el traidor, bajaron y bajaron soldado y pueblo un solo ser, bajaron armados de constitución, bajaron por ti, por mí, por los que despreciaron y bajaron. Se encontraron, se quedaron en una prueba de amor. El pueblo noble y luchador por Venezuela, por su honor, van al combate con fervor a rescatar con hidalguía a Hugo Chávez Frías, el comandante. Por su honor van al combate con fervor a rescatar con hidalguía a Hugo Chávez Frías, el comandante. So I think two uh, beautiful videos that really show the continuation 20 years ago until today, the determination of the people of Venezuela to continue defending their sovereignty, self-determination, their democratically elected government, and really um, what responsibility we have as people here in North America uh, to really uh, demand and our governments end these cruel attacks on people uh, who want to be free and sovereign and not under the boot of the United States. And um, yeah, beautiful, really beautiful uh, videos today and continuing um, to feel what it's like a little bit to be in Venezuela, although I wish we could all be there and see it for ourselves. Um, so I uh, just wanted to say that Yo Nando Cantos, the song, the chance uh, during it for people that may not have understood. I think the context is very clear. A lot of that is footage, of course, from the attempted coup and the the, um, the chorus that, that is played throughout uh, says, Ooh, ah, Chavez no se va, so Chavez isn't going and, and that he stayed, se queda, he's here. And also, Ooh, ah, Victoria Popular, or, um, popular victory. So people have brought him back and you can see that in the video. Thank you. So uh, from there, I wanted to go to um, our next speaker for today's online picket action. Uh, 
Benjamin Prado is someone that I've met recently, actually in Venezuela. We were both there, part of a delegation to observe the elections uh, that took place in uh, December of just this last year of 2021, and uh, was able to learn more about the important work that he does uh, in the United States and uh, looking forward to hearing today as well. Um, Benjamin Prado is the Under Secretary General of Union de Barrio, which is an organization in the United States that works in defense of Mexican and Latin American communities. Thank you for joining us today. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Alison. Y eh, está bien si lo hago en español, sí, porque para poder comunicarme mejor con el concepto y las ideas de que tenemos nosotros como Unión del Barrio eh, con la Revolución Bolivariana. Y para Unión del Barrio, una organización de mexicanos y latinoamericanos que se constituye en 1981, se constituye con el, con el objetivo de reconocernos como mexicanos, latinoamericanos en nuestra propia tierra, que viene de una lucha del, de los movimientos chicanos. Y ese movimiento pues reconoce que nuestros pueblos, como pueblos originarios a este continente, no reconoce estas fronteras impuestas por los Estados Unidos y que nuestra lucha se extiende más allá de las fronteras políticas eh, del imperio que de hecho en su, eh, en su historia de imponer... Disculpe, disculpe Benjamin, un poco más eh, despacio, por favor. Ah, perdón, para no, la interpretación, no, no. ¿verdad? Sí, discúlpeme. <risas> Eh, reconocemos pues de que es, ha sido el imperialismo en su afán de extender su dominio político, económico y social más allá de sus fronteras, lo inicia con el concepto del destino manifiesto, lo continúa con esta política eh, de la doctrina Monroy y que recientemente lo presenta en el contexto de eh, el, lo que Obama definió como eh, el excepcionalismo norteamericano, precisamente para socavar el derecho internacional que tienen todos los pueblos para mantener y defender su soberanía. Y reconocemos precisamente que lo que se está viendo en el día de hoy con eh, el, el papel de los Estados Unidos que pretende eh, en, en, de que pretende mantener un orden económico, social, uh, político eh, en una crisis donde traspasa una crisis precisamente porque los pueblos se han dado cuenta de la necesidad de crear un mundo multipolar, multicéntrico que no dependa simplemente del dominio norteamericano y pues nosotros como Unión del Barrio nos sumamos a esa lucha porque reconocemos que la lucha de Venezuela de Cuba y de los pueblos de nuestra América, muy particularmente los pueblos que conforman los países de la Alianza Bolivariana para los Pueblos de Nuestra América, forma parte de esa historia, de esta lucha para crear un mundo multipolar, multicéntrico y de recuperar de una manera muy puntual, muy clara, nuestros recursos económicos, recuperar el valor de nuestro trabajo, de crear condiciones para el buen vivir, como se está planteando claramente, y, y a final de cuenta, creando estos estados socialistas para el, el bien de la clase trabajadora. Y es lo que vemos en la revolución bol bolivariana, en su constitución de 1999, eh, cuya constitución es, es eh, una que contempla y lucha por la defensa de los derechos humanos de una manera muy clara, que en el esfuerzo de constituir eh, un Estado socialista, eh, como, lo plantea Hugo, como lo planteó Hugo Chávez Frías, como se mantiene en esta marcha eh, bajo el presidente legítimo de Venezuela, eh, Nicolás Maduro Moros, está muy claro en el planteamiento de crear las condiciones necesarias para vivir una vida digna con una atención adecuada a, a las necesidades sociales de la clase trabajadora en materia de salud universal, en materia de vivienda, en materia de 
eh, eh, educación superior en materia de las necesidades básicas que todo ser humano necesitamos para vivir una vida digna y, y, y para Unión del Barrio es eh, un, un hecho, una necesidad histórica que eh, tenemos que defender estos procesos de cambio social porque la situación económica capitalista que está en profunda crisis no es sostenible para la humanidad. Imposible poder mantener el curso que mantiene este Estados Unidos sin dañar, eh, sin arremeter contra la vida humana en este planeta. Y entonces para nosotros, Unión del Barrio, eh, eh, estamos con la revolución bolivariana de Venezuela eh, y nos solidarizamos precisamente en este caso de Alex Saab, muy importante para nosotros porque precisamente este concepto del, del excepcionalismo norteamericano socava ese derecho internacional e, e, y en una manera eh, muy que, arre, que, que, que es considerada realmente parte de un proceso de guerra que ya ha lanzado en contra no solo de en contra de Venezuela pero con las sanciones que impone de manera unilateral de manera eh, realmente ilegal en, en el ámbito internacional y para nosotros pues eh, lo vemos no claramente de que si mantiene su curso en la historia entonces qué mecanismo va a poder asegurar un orden de paz en el mundo. Entonces, realmente es una lucha en defensa de la paz, en defensa de, de, de asegurar que haya un orden eh, internacional eh, claro y que las reglas aplican a todos, no, que no haya excepcionalismos. Y ese para nosotros es muy importante. Y, y vamos a llevar este mensaje como parte de nuestro deber de vivir adentro de estas fronteras políticas a las calles. Lo vamos a llevar a las calles presentes precisamente para este primero de mayo, que el primero de mayo, el Día Internacional de los Trabajadores, para nosotros representa ese momento que une la clase trabajadora en, a nivel internacional, que necesitamos alzar nuestra voz en defensa de no solo eh, eh, Venezuela, sino también la República Revolucionaria de Cuba, que también está sufriendo bajo estas políticas eh, económicas, sanciones y bloqueos económicos, financieros y comerciales eh, que está tratando de estrangular un ejemplo, el ejemplo de un estado de los trabajadores, el ejemplo de los, de los trabajadores en el poder, eh, porque lo que vemos ahorita en estos días dentro de Estados Unidos es una dictadura del capital, una dictadura del capitalismo que está, en, que está fracasando en todos los áreas, eh, en todo el ámbito social. En, eh, si vemos lo que ocurre eh, en Estados Unidos con tanta, eh, tantas personas sin acceso a la salud, eh, sin acceso a vivienda digna, eh, sin acceso a educación adecuada, y, y una educación relevante, porque realmente acá también se hacen muchas mentiras acerca de, de la historia, ¿no? Pero eh, vemos que tenemos esa obligación de unir nuestros esfuerzos con eh, los esfuerzos de los trabajadores más allá de las fronteras y sumarnos especialmente porque ya viene esta eh, reunión tan importante que se va a llevar a cabo, bueno, para nosotros importante para denunciar que es la, la cumbre de las Américas que se va a llevar a cabo en Los Ángeles y que tenemos una obligación también de denunciar esas políticas eh, e ilegales extraterritoriales de las sanciones contra Cuba y Venezuela y nuestra y es nuestro compromiso de sumarnos y participar en esta en, en ese ámbito para denunciar esas políticas cuyo único objetivo es promover el capitalismo neoliberal fracasado. Entonces vamos a, a, a llevar este mensaje también a esa cumbre y sumarnos a las luchas de los pueblos de nuestra América y en su momento vamos a, a trabajar para que tengamos la oportunidad de intercambiar con trabajadores acá en Tijuana, en la frontera con Tijuana. Pero con eso dejo aquí eh, mi intervención. Saludos revolucionarios a los y las venezolanas. Muchas gracias. Thank you again to Benjamin Prado from Unión del Barrio 
Um, it is great to have you here today and also uh, to um, have the announcement you've just made about the conference in Tijuana. So um, we can go ahead and bring up the poster for that and do the announcement now. Uh, in June, uh, US President Biden has called for the Summit of the Americas to take place in Los Angeles, California. So uh, this is an organization and a call by the United States to really, I think, continue their establishment of what Biden so um, directly said was working in America's front yard, that the US somehow has the, the right to control what happens in, in Mexico and further south throughout Latin America, um, and really people of the world standing up and saying no is what this Cumbre de las Americas de los Trabajadores is about. So an international meeting of uh, workers against uh, the summit of the Americas, building our own summit as workers, as, as people uh, united across the Americas. Um, it's gonna take place in Tijuana, Tijuana, Mexico, June 10th through 12th, 2022. So put that in your schedule and um, look out for more information, which we'll be sending out in the coming days. And we look forward uh, from FIRE This Time and other organizations across Canada to working together with you in Union del Barrio and other groups in the United States to build this important meeting. So thank you. The next speaker that we have uh, today is going to be uh, Coming from up here, you can probably tell it's perhaps snowing where Radhika is speaking from in Winnipeg, Canada. Um, not here in British Columbia, but these things happen. So uh, Professor Radhika Desai is a professor at the Department of Political Studies and director of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group at the University of Manitoba, among other important uh, work. She's also a founding member of the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg, Canada, and that's where she's joining us uh, from here today. So thank you very much again, Radhika, for joining us, and the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much, Alison. And yes, indeed, we've just had a spring blizzard here and it's still snowing from what I can see. So, And I'm speaking to you today from Winnipeg, which is also the homeland of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, the Dakota and the Dene peoples, and also the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, I decided that since there are so many speakers here who know so much more about the exact detailed situation of Alex Saab than I do, I'm going to focus on the larger picture. And the title that I've given my remarks is uh, includes a word that Indriana has already uh, used. It is a blowback. The title is sanctions blowback, hegemony blowback. Basically, the, uh, uh, I want to put the kidnapping of Alex Saab in a larger context because Alex Saab's kidnapping by the United States is part of a long, long list of illegal activities that the United States has been engaged in for decades, for, for if, if, not, if not a couple of centuries. From, uh, it has engaged in coups from Guatemala to Chile to Iran and now possibly Pakistan. It has engaged in killings and assassinations from Lumumba all the way to more recently General Qasem Soleimani. It has engaged in kidnappings and extraordinary renditions and other forms of persecution of individuals whose actions the United States finds inconvenient, such as Assange, Manning, Snowden, and a whole lot of others. It has engaged in illegal and duplicitous wars. And basically, quite frankly, I think it has an illegal conception of its own security interests, which allow it to go to wars thousands of miles away from its borders. The United States does this in pursuit, pursuit of a vain aim. People know it as hegemony, but in my own work, I have shown that it is it, it, it is an imaginary conception of a domination that it cannot enjoy. Indeed, it imagines that Britain once enjoyed such a domination over the world, which was not in fact true. When <clears throat> Britain allegedly dominated the world, there were already many challenges to her domination. So also it has been true of the United States. So in fact, 
all the theories and all the writing that has been done about hegemony is really no better than putting essentially this ambition, which has been nursed by American <clears throat> business people and policymakers for more than a century now in a theoretical disguise. The fact is that the United States from its very beginnings was expansionary. <clears throat> and once it completed its internal colonization, it was faced, that is to say, it, once its borders reached California, being prevented from moving north by the British Empire and south by Mexico, the question was, what next? And essentially, it wanted to continue its expansion in some other way. The Monroe Doctrine, the Open Door Doctrine, these were all part of the same <coughs> ambition. And the United States, uh, you know, everybody thinks that the United States became naturally the hegemon of the world uh, after the Second World War because it was the biggest economy. But what this statement forgets is that the this, this was a result of what we may call war profiteering. Because while the war destroyed America's competitors, Japan, Western Europe, etc., it actually vastly expanded the American economy because the American economy, while not suffering many blows, barring a few ships destroyed at Pearl Harbor, it actually expanded massively as the supplier of arms, ammunition, and other war material to the to its so to its allies, by the way, which it uh, for which it got a very hefty return. So the United States economy doubled in size between 1939 and 1945. Now, to give you an idea of how just how profitable this was for the United States, it would not double in size again for the next 22 years. So compare that six years versus 22 years, even though those were 22 years of the so-called golden age. The American aim of hegemony, which, as I say, is impossible, it is vain, but it, the aim involves three things. It involves unifying the world, it involves subordinating this unified world, and it involves keeping it capitalist, which means that a small core around the United States can enjoy the benefits and everybody else pays the price because capitalism is, is deeply and form formatively linked with imperialism. So uh, in order to do this, uh, the United States in the, in the most recent era, the United States and uh, uh, aided by the United Kingdom, led the world out of the crisis of the 1970s towards neoliberalism as the only way of keeping it capitalist. There was no other way. However, this had a paradoxical effect of weakening these economies productively, financializing them, in, and increasing their reliance on force and fraud to keep their leading positions. And now that even and by now, however, all these strategies are also not working. The CIA is supposed to have coined the term blowback to refer to the unintended consequences and unwanted side effects of its covert operation. Today, we are witnessing the blowback of the entire strategy of American hegemony, which today rise, relies a great deal on sanctions blowback. Um, and, 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 and as I say, of course, it also is hegemony blowback. So that by now, in a very important sense, uh, what Venezuela was suffering more or less on its own, now the possibility for Venezuela to widen its network of contacts potential allies in the third world is increasing massively. In this war that the United States is fighting with NATO and the, the idea of a rules-based international order, they are directly opposed to the UN Charter, which is the actual foundation, the institutional foundation of international peace and international law and the vision of international law, the anti-imperialist vision of international law that it embodies. And so this is the, this is the ultimate uh, uh, tension. Now, the US pursuit of uh, with NATO and with this so-called rules-based international order or RUBIO for short, this pursuit is now undermining 
the whatever position the United States ever had, it's making the United States less attractive, not just to third world countries, but even to its closest allies. So the um, US attempts to unify the world under its domination are having the opposite effect. They are actually accelerating the division of the world into a uh, into a small world centered around the decaying, financialized, neoliberal and militaristic capitalism of the United States. And on the other hand, the prospering socialist market economy around China and all China's allies. On the US side, even its own allies cannot support it fulsomely. Germany uh, is too reliant on Russian gas at the moment to support their United States sanction strategy. Emmanuel Macron continues to insist that it, he is going to try to create a autonomous European peace with Russia, not least because uh, uh, Marine Le Pen is nipping at his electoral heels, saying that she's going to take France out of the command structures of NATO. And even Japan, which is normally appears so compliant with the United States, it is pulled too much by the economic gravity of China to actually comply with uh, all of the United States demands. So Japan is saying, you know what, we cannot sequester a, a Russian reserves. We actually do not have laws that permit that. So the United States elites are going to continue, however, to pursue this aim because you know what, they have no plan B. They do not have a plan as to what they would do if they cannot dominate the world, if they must become, as one writer said in the 1970s, an ordinary country. Doing so would be good for the United States and the vast majority of its citizens, but its elites will hear no more of it. So the kidnapping of Alex Saab is part of this futile and destructive path. It is leading nowhere good. It will require all the sense and rationality that anti-imperialist forces, particularly in the US, can muster to forestall the worst. So let me just conclude my remarks with one final observation. In the United States, particularly the United States and its Western allies have, and, and particularly the Ukrainians have been uh, it, it, multiplying the references to the Second World War and claiming that we are in a Third World War, etc. Let me just leave you with a very sobering conclusion. In the Second World War, socialism and capitalism, namely the Western liberal ally, uh, uh, countries and Soviet Union fought on the same side against fascism. However, in this new situation, it increasingly looks as though socialist countries will have to fight against the joint forces of capitalism and fascism. It's a frightening thought, but I think that's where we may very well be. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Radhika Desai, uh, for joining us here today and helping us put context uh, to the US-led campaign against Venezuela, which of course uh, impacts people around the world and is a policy they've carried out against uh, countries all around the world. I believe it is over 30 countries are under US sanctions at any given time, and people are facing those impacts. Um, also, uh, appreciate um, as well uh, how uh, we're able to in that way talk about how Venezuela is important uh, to people around the world, how Venezuela is continuing to stand up, has really represented and stood as a, a kingpin, as a very important piece of Latin America's resistance against this uh, US uh, war drive and, and uh, kind of US uh, attempt to control the entire world, um, which is uh, falling apart in many ways. And uh, one of the ways they have been completely unsuccessful is in Venezuela. So next we have uh, Professor Luis Acuna, who we are very grateful is able to join us uh, every month to give some important perspective. Uh, Professor Luis Acuna is currently the Charge des Affairs at the Venezuelan Embassy here in Canada, uh, but is not speaking to us from Canada because uh, the government of Canada um, has 
ruptured relations with the government of Venezuela in many ways and not made it possible for Professor Luisa Cunha to be here with us in Canada uh, doing work uh, for Venezuela. But we're really honored to have him join us uh, from Venezuela to give his perspective and uh, to speak more about um, what we can do as people here in Canada uh, to organize against this criminal blockade against Venezuela and what really the um, and that's it. <laughs> we look forward to hearing from you, Luis, today. Uh, sometimes there are some problems with audio um, and the video, but we'll try it and see how strong the signal is. It's great to see you. Hello, Alison. Hello, everybody. I want to thank Adriana Parada, Radhika Desai, and uh, Benjamin Prado. And of course, I want to thank uh, Alison Bodin and the organization of FAR this time, because this monthly uh, webinar in behalf of Venezuela has been very, very important. Uh, as I said, every month you are our voice abroad and we need people who speak for Venezuela abroad. We need that uh, the struggle of Venezuela for their sovereignty uh, keeps going and that will keep going with the help of the solidarity group of all the world and mainly from Canada and the US. Actually, uh, we are at this moment in the commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the coup d'etat of 2002. That was the first coup d'etat that we have against Hugo Chavez because there were many and all of them were supported by the US. And there is no doubt that about, about that. And I want to thank Radhika Desai because uh, their words uh, explain what's happening. The US decided to I mean, not to take care of the rule, rule of law, not to take care of any sovereignty of any country, but their interest. And the US has been interested in keeping control of Venezuela since many, many years ago. As a matter of fact, before Hugo Chavez stay in, in power, they were in control of Venezuela because they were in control of the oil industry and the oil industry was the one that supported Venezuela. The coup d'etat of 2002 uh, was, you, we, can, uh, we can show all the documents that show how the US participated in that coup d'etat. I was uh, a, I mean, uh, I was there in the coup d'etat of 2002. We, uh, I happened to be a, a deputy of the National Assembly and we were committed to go and stay in Miraflores in a stand while everything was happening. Uh, we were able to see the snipers killing the people that they kill in order to create the chaos that at the end with the participation of some people who uh, betray Presidente Chavez, were able to produce that effect. And they tried pregnating that uh, Presidente Chavez resigned to the, to the uh, presidency. He did not. And he, we were able to show that there, there, wa there was a very, very, uh, pretty letter of Presidente Chavez saying that I am not, I, I have not resigned it to the presidency of Venezuela. Uh, so after that, they did not stop. That happened in April of 2002. And by the end of, of 2002, they shut down, I mean, the, the, the US with the complicity of some of the member of the oil industry, they were able to shut down completely the oil industry and they shut down the country. And that was a very, very 
a difficult situation for Venezuela. And we were able to go out of that situation too. And after that, you can imagine how many things happen uh, here with the US until 2015, uh, when they decided to declare Venezuela uh, a, I mean, a enemy, let's say, of the US. And after that, you know how many things had happened with a Presidente Maduro that has been done an extraordinary work and he has been able to stand in the presidency with all the uh, things that the US have done to overthrow him. Because the US don't care about overthrowing anyone. They decided to overthrow uh, Salvador Allende and they did it. I mean, if they decide to overthrow any country, they will go and they will try to do it. They have been trying to do it in Venezuela and we have been able to stand, you know, strong here with many difficulties. And uh, the, uh, the way in which they need to go in war with Venezuela are the uh, unilateral uh, aggressive measures. I mean, they are not killing Venezuelans with uh, guns. They are killing the Venezuelans, not allowing the Venezuelans to get food, to get medicine, to get anything. Uh, th there is another kind of war, the, the, the unilateral sanctions. So uh, they decided, why? Because they want to have the control of Venezuela. That's the only reason. Now let's uh, is one example too of what the US is able to do not taking care of anything. They don't care about the rule of law. We can demonstrate to in the court in, in the US all, all we want about the legality of, uh, of Alex Saab, but they won't care. They will do anything they want. So we have to keep uh, fighting because the only way we can stay like we are is fighting. We cannot, I mean, we cannot do any other thing than that. And we will keep fighting for the liberty of uh, Alex Saab because we know we will, we will be able to do it. We will, we will be able to get Alex Saab out of that jail. Uh, not because they will, um, obey the rule of law, because this is not a matter of law. This is a matter of politics. And doing politics, we think we will be able to, to get to that point. In the meanwhile, we really appreciate all the work that the uh, lawyers are doing in order to show to the world that Alex Saab has been kidnapped, that Alex Saab is a true uh, diplomat and that Alex Saab has been in a illegally way kidnapped by the US. And the lawyers are doing a very, very good job doing that. And I want to thank Adriana Parada for all the information that she has been giving us today. So uh, uh, Alison, we want to thank you again. We want to thank for this time for this uh, webinar that allows uh, people from the US, people from Canada and people from the world to know what's going on in Venezuela and how the struggle of the Venezuelan uh, is trying to, I mean, to be a sovereign country and being able to by their own work, the work of the, of, of the people of Venezuela, keep going. We are not asking to the US any other thing leave us alone, free Alex Saab and let us do what we need to do as a sovereign country. Thanks very much, uh, Alison. Uh, we really appreciate your work. Thank you, Professor Luis Acuna for continuing your work under uh, how difficult it is to be a diplomat and not in the country in which you are supposed to be serving as a diplomat but still doing your work every day. So uh, thank you for all of that. 
And uh, also, I think it's important we recognize um, that there have been, just in this past month, important steps uh, made that show that it is a good time for us to continue to put pressure on the government of the US and the government of Canada to end these criminal sanctions. And that includes a delegation from the US government that visited Venezuela and met with the democratically elected president, President Nicolas Maduro and his cabinet, uh, when out of the other side of their mouth, they refused to even recognize the legitimacy of the government of President Maduro and instead continue to parade around their puppet Wang Guaido. So those are cracks that are beginning to show in the US's sanctions, brutal sanctions regime against Venezuela, and I think show it's an important time for us to redouble our campaign. And your words are always inspiring for us to hear uh, from Venezuela uh, as we continue this struggle, as well as the importance of uniting our voices for freedom for Alex Saab. Really appreciate everyone that's been posting in the chat today. So many uh, comments from many different parts of Venezuela and also around the world of people uh, exclaiming their uh, demand of freedom for Alex Saab, of people uh, speaking from wherever they're at uh, to say that uh, they appreciate the work that we're doing here in North America, but we know we have the responsibility to do more and to strengthen our campaign. So um, the next part of our program, we hear from people that have uh, joined us from different groups and organizations across Canada um, who are able to share greetings uh, to uh, bring us some perspective from where they are working uh, to the picket action. And then we will come together for our group photo. Um, today, we have a, a number of different uh, greetings and then also just some announcements uh, that I would like to make. I also, yes, do want to recognize we have uh, participation of uh, Gustavo Rojas, who has been writing messages in the chat from Colombia. It is great to have the support of you, Gustavo, and the Colombian movement in solidarity with Cuba. Um, so for our uh, announcements, here today. Uh, one is going to partly address, I think, a question that someone asked in the chat about what exactly the charges are against Alex Saab. Um, I'm going to post an article um, written in English. I know that there are many important articles also written in Spanish, and if people want to post informational articles or updates in the chat, uh, Idriana, please do so, um, and we will get them. Uh, we wanted to let people know that our next picket action is going to be Thursday, May 12th. So mark that in your calendar, Thursday, May 12th at 4 p.m. Pacific time, which now is 7 p.m. Eastern time, also 7 p.m. in Caracas. Um, and we will have the speaker, one of the speakers will be the author of that article that I've posted, Roger Harris, who will join us from Task Force of the Americas also participation from the Free Alex Saab campaign in Venezuela, Professor Luis Acuna and others. So we'll post information about that in the chat. Also wanted uh, to announce again, the Cumbre de las Americas taking place in Tijuana, Mexico, June 10th through 12th, 2022. And will be more information available soon. And we will share that with all the participating organizations and individuals that have been joining the picket actions where I'm sure the case of Alex Saab will be an important topic of discussion as people unite in order to uh, stand against the uh, US-led so-called Summit of the Americas, which will not feature the voices of workers from Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and so many other countries that are under uh, really pressure from the United States and under attack from the US and their allies. Right before the conference in Tijuana, there's also the People's Summit for Democracy, a response as well to the Summit of the Americas. This is taking place in the same city as the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles, California, June 8th, 9th, and 10th. There will be a series of events and protests and encourage people to uh, sign up to get more information or to add your organization to a growing list of endorsers. It is, uh, 
More information is available at peoplesummit2022.org. And then on April 26th at 3 p.m., the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, the um, Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg and other organizations are joining together with the Alliance for Global Justice based in the United States for a webinar to free Alex Saab taking place at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, the 26th of April, which will feature Camilla Fabri Saab, the wife of diplomat Alex Saab and former polit political prisoner in the United States from Puerto Rico, Oscar Lopez Rivera, who is now free, as well as, as people can see on the screen, some other important speakers. Really encourage people to uh, go to freealexsob.org for more information and to make sure you register for this important webinar. So without further ado, we'll invite up our uh, people that are going to be able to give us some greetings from organizations that have come together every month in order to demand freedom for Alex Saab and an end to criminal U.S. sanctions and Canada's complicity in these sanctions against Venezuela. I'm just sending the invite so they can join us here in our uh, Zoom space. The first one I would like to invite is John Philpot, who is joining us from Just Peace Advocates. John, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? That's okay? Fine. Yes, sounds great. Well, um, on behalf of Just Peace Advocates, we're very, very pleased to support this activity and admire your terrific work and all the wonderful presentations that we have heard today. And I never end. I always learn. I attended the last one and I always learn from every meeting you have. And I'd like to just comment that the situation internationally is favorable to Mr. Saab and it's favorable to Venezuela. And I'll say why I think that. The Russian resistance to the empire is a, a once in, well, a, once in a century event. I'm not, I think I'm wrong. It's more than once in 50 years event. But anyway, it's a very strong event, uh, fight. And it will weaken the US and the empire um, in a very important way. We don't have it all played out now, but the results are obvious that it's going to weaken the empire. I'd like to recall for those of us on the progressive side that Hugo Chavez Frias made a speech, which William Kamakaro sent me today in favor of Russia when Mr. Medvedev was president and um, Mr. Putin was prime minister, and he spoke of the historical importance of Russia resisting the US and the plans of the US to destroy Russia with its magnificent history, which we all, uh, a lot of us know about. We also, I reckon, I saw last week, Mr. Maduro, uh, Nicolas Maduro speaking about the plan to destroy Russia and break it up like they did in Yugoslavia. And I would call on the Western progressives to think carefully about this and try and not play an opportunist role of trying to balance off with the social Democrats of, like the NDP, who are in Canada, for those of you who are not, not from Canada, the NDP is allied to the Liberal Party. And we have to build an anti-war movement and this is going to help with the campaign to free Alex Saab and stop the Canadian. We're in Canada. Not everybody here is, but we, I'm in Canada. We have to stop our government from doing what it's doing. And Christy Freeland, who said last week with, with the budget that they have, no one will be free until Putin and his government are vanquished. That's a declaration of war even stronger than what Biden said in Poland 10 days ago. And Mrs. Freeland is also one of the strong advocates of sanctions against Venezuela and non-recognition of the Venezuelan government. So these are things, we're in Canada, we have to change our government's policies on war and empire. And 
That's why uh, Just Peace Advocates is very pleased to be joining in this support for Alex Saab. Um, I've been involved. I was. I went to Venezuela in October with uh, in November with Allison and many others, and we are going to support you and work with you until this is uh, won. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's great also to have the support of Just Peace Advocates, and also yes, very important reminder that. Uh, our work of defending Venezuela, calling for freedom of Alex Saab, also needs to include building a, a more united and stronger anti-war movement here in Canada and the United States. These are very related. Next, I wanted to ask Bhagwan if he's uh, able to say hello from uh, the Global African Congress, uh, who is uh, often able to join us um, at these pickets, and it's been great to have your support as well. Thank you very much, uh, Alison, and thank you, uh, Professor Acuna, Professor Desai, and uh, particularly, I, I was really moved by the words of uh, Comrade uh, Prado. So to everyone in Venezuela, I would like to just say that, rest assured that we are here, in fact, working very, very hard. I'm speaking to you from the nation's capital, which is Ottawa in Canada, and uh, believe it or not, I think it's starting to to hit our political decision makers, that we're no longer in the unipolar world of you know, neoliberalism running roughshod across the globe. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just this morning, uh, I, I did an op-ed piece in the Hill Times, uh, and I'm not the only one, several other voices, former senators, others are now speaking up to make the point that uh, you know, we are in fact right now into multipolar uh, makeup of the world. And in a multipolar world, you cannot be dogmatic and ideological. And as somebody said just earlier, uh, Mr. Philpott, that, you know, Krista Freeland can run and have an apartment that she goes to visit in Kiev and meantime, you know, playing all kinds of games with the Lima group. And so that's gonna come back to haunt you. So we are reminding our government and we can also reassure you that actually we're beginning to see signs of change. They're not coming as rapidly, but some of the rhetoric now is starting to slow down. We're hearing now the kind of the bravado and the machismo that was coming out, I would say only six months ago, is no longer there. Uh, we have seen with, uh, with Russia, for example, that even the threat of sanctions, um, it's no longer carried the weight that they thought they did. The ruble before, you know, in the beginning of March, it was at 144 uh, uh, rubles to a dollar. And now it's actually uh, trading better than before. The, uh, uh, the, the Ukraine crisis. So things like this are now taking to effect. Um, you know, uh, our, our, our uh, aggressiveness is beginning in check. And I would just like to say once again to all the comrades in Venezuela, here in Canada, let's build up that anti-war movement. I think that's a really good idea. Uh, fire this time, you're doing an absolute uh, work and it's, it's slow and steady, but you know, that's what it takes when you're doing good work. It's gonna take a while to get the payoff, but signs are definitely there that the payoff is just on the horizon. So let's remain united, remain focused, and uh, keep it going, Allison. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those words from Ottawa, the capital city of Canada. And we look forward to continuing to work together with the Global African Congress. Next, I wanted to invite Andrew Barry. Andrew is joining from Mobilization Against War and Occupation, Vancouver's Peace Coalition. Thanks, Allison. Uh, to go off the energy and optimism of uh, the last speaker, I think it's, uh, it's really fitting that we were marking today, uh, our webinar is the marking 20 year anniversary of victory of the people of Venezuela against the United States coup that happened. And I think it's really great to uh, reflect on this, this huge victory that happened for working class people and oppressed people across the world. Looking just at Venezuela, it had been centuries of colonialism and domination from Spain, from the United States against the people of Venezuela, stealing everything from them for so long, having a David and Goliath style battle of a, a huge empire trying to dictate for centuries just against Venezuela what it can and cannot do. And for Venezuela to reverse that was such a huge victory for Venezuela and for working class people around the world that it is possible 
to stand up against the empire and win. It's sometimes dismissed in mainstream media as just a failed coup attempt, but it's so much more to that than that for people in Venezuela who died, to the people who did die during the coup d'etat from the violence of the US orchestrated coup. And when we look at it in a global uh, context of what happened in April of 2002, this was in the midst of a huge campaign of aggression and arrogance from the United States on the world. Just a few months prior to it was the United States aggressive and arrogant war on the people of Afghanistan, just bombing into obliteration the people in Afghanistan. Then came this coup d'etat because it was Hugo Chavez who spoke up against the bombing in Afghanistan, saying you cannot fight terror with more terror, which is exactly what the United States did in Afghanistan. This campaign in Afghanistan, in Venezuela, continued later in the year of 2002 with the huge oil sabotage on the people of Venezuela. The United States was not happy. They, they were not content with just a failed attempt at overthrowing Venezuela's government. They tried again. They also did their campaigns around the world with the war in Iraq, the coup d'etat in Haiti in 2004, war on Somalia and Sudan that began in 2006, extending their war in Afghanistan to Pakistan. They also went after uh, Palestine, increasing the intensification of the Zionist occupation and murder and occupation of the people of Palestine. They, can, they did more coup d'etats in Latin America, in Honduras, in Brazil, in Paraguay. That today, we are li looking at the world's hu biggest humanitarian crisis is in Yemen, where the United States, Canada, and UK are funding a war by Saudi Arabia against the people of Yemen. This is all in the context of what the United States is doing across the world and what they did in Venezuela, it failed. And I think when we look back now on 20 years during all this war and chaos created by the United States and their allies on people of the world, how huge it was, this victory that happened in 2002. The United States has had many failures over the years in trying to do what it wanted to do onto the world. And this is one of the biggest failures that they did. And Venezuela was the reason that they were able to, Venezuela stood up and said no to this aggression from the United States. And I think that when we look at also what is happening in the world today with the US and NATO aggression and expansion in Europe, we are seeing that they are becoming more desperate. 20 years ago, when the United States could not put Pedro Carmona as president in Venezuela, they tried again with Juan Guaido today. And they're becoming even more desperate today when they are going after diplomats now. They kidnapped Alex Saab. This is this along with what they are doing in Europe. They're trying a coup attempt in Pakistan, all around the world. They're showing signs of desperation. So I think it's very important that we reflect on our victories and continue our efforts to work united and together in stopping and standing up to the United States and Canada's aggressions that are happening around the world. And I think. Also what uh, comrade Benjamin uh, uh, Prado said earlier about the exceptionalism of the United States and how hypocritical it is. We need to continuously pounce on that because that exceptionalism that the United States is always talking about the United, around the world where they are committing these crimes of war, of aggression on people in the world and then turn around and put sanctions and blockade on the people of Venezuela for human rights. This is could the biggest hypocrisy in the world with what we have seen. So I think that we will continue to be here. We will continue to fight united until Alex Saab is freed, until the blockade on Venezuela comes to an end. Free Alex Saab, US hands off Venezuela, Canada hands off Venezuela. Thank you, Andrew Barry uh, from Mobilization Against War and Occupation uh, for that. Excellent intervention. It uh, rem reminded me of what is important to consider right now, uh, which is, yes, Venezuela has made great victories against the United States attacks, including the return of President Hugo Chavez as the rightful president April 13th, 2002, 20 years ago. And we too will also win victory for Alex Saab. We will free Alex Saab. He will be home in Venezuela uh, with his family and with his people. And uh, we have made great victories when we unite and stand together. And the people of Venezuela are showing us the way. So
So um, thank you all for a great panel today, uh, for taking time out of your evenings to join us, to unite our voices. We're going to begin to invite people to please turn on your cameras if you're able, and I encourage you to turn on your cameras. We're gonna take a group photo together as people across uh, many continents, actually. I've, I've seen there's now people joining us from Australia and uh, parts of Europe. So it's great to have you here tonight. And uh, we've heard from people all across uh, Canada, uh, from Winnipeg and Ottawa and Toronto and also uh, Montreal and from people in the United States all the way down um, at the US-Mexico border. So uh, thank you again for all of our speakers to Professor Radhika Desai, to Benjamin Prado, to Professor Luis Acuna and to Indriana Parada from, for joining us here today. Um, we're gonna start moving it to gallery view so you can see each other's faces and uh, really come together to unite our voices to demand freedom for Alex Saab. We wish that we could be uh, together in the streets. Um, I hope and encourage everyone to join in the events uh, that are mounting a people's response, a worker's response to the summit of the Americas that President Biden has called for in June. We must uh, unite and say that this summit of the Americas does not speak for the people of the Americas. We as poor working and oppressed people across Canada, the United States, Latin America, Central and South America, we, uh, when we unite, stand together and are the voice of the summit of the Americas. We stand with people in Venezuela and the government of Venezuela in defense of Venezuela's sovereignty and self-determination as we continue this fight to free Alex Saab and also to end criminal sanctions against the people of Venezuela, which every day create hardships for the people of Venezuela, deny them access to food, basic medicines, to goods. We are here today to unite our voices from around the world and demand freedom for Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab held in US jails on trumped up charges of money laundering. Uh, we demand that Alex Saab be given his rightful diplomatic immunity, be released from jail immediately and be returned to his wife Camilla and the people of Venezuela where he can continue the important work. Again, people are asking in the chat. They're saying they can't turn it on. I'm just working through the list <laughs> of uh, how to uh, be able to participate in the group photo. Um, I, you will see an invitation appear on your screen that says, do you want to join as a panelist? If you say yes, then you will rejoin the picket as a panelist. Uh, estamos en el proceso a uh, invitar todo a participar en nuestra acción como panelistas. Si recibe una invitación a ser una panelista, por favor, diga yes, sí, y puedes usar su cámara. Thank you, everyone, again. It's, uh, there's a lot of us online today, so I want to make sure everyone gets the invitation. It just takes a second. That is a big knock. In order uh, to uh, unite our voices, we'll be able to um, chant together as if we were at a protest on the streets, which I know many of us have been missing at this uh, time of pandemic. We are hopefully coming out of that and we'll be able to unite again on the streets, go back to protesting in front of the US consulates and the United States embassies and joining together with the people of Venezuela to demand an end to these sanctions and blockade and freedom for Alex Saab. If you haven't received no. an invitation, hopefully you will shortly. Um, I see there are definitely some more folks still joining us. We'll do one more round. That is a big no. And then we will be able to uh, begin our action here today. Our photo here today. Can't uh, tell who's uh, the speaking. 
Unfortunately, we have someone here who is being quite rude and uh, our apologies. We're trying to figure out who that is so that we can remove them from today's action. Um, but um, we have not uh, identified that yet. Um, let's do one more round of invitations and take our group photo. You are all looking in incredible uh, from many different countries and places. It's good to see your faces and to have your support here today against these sanctions on Venezuela and to demand freedom for Alex Saab. I promise I'll let you know when we take the photo, we can raise our fists together and hold up our signs. Okay. We're in the letter M. Anyone that may want to know, A few more letters in the alphabet. John Acosta, I will find you here. You are waiting for an invitation and you haven't received one. Please post in the chat and I will make sure you get one. Some people, unfortunately, it might be a setting on your Zoom that doesn't allow you to receive the pop ups. But if you see the pop up, go ahead and say yes if you would like to turn on your camera and unite our voices together. I'm now in the letter D, so Will will be up in to the letter A. Okay. Oh. Bueno, eh, vamos a empezar con la foto. Si recibe un mensaje a unir como una panelista, este es necesario a decir sí en orden a usar su cámara y su micrófono. Pienso que tomo, todo que pueden participar estamos, estamos aquí, incluyendo los en el chat. Thank you everyone for joining here today. Thank you especially to our interpreters who joined. Uh, we had Julieta and Enrique joining from Argentina. Thank you so much for your work tonight. It's, a lot of live presentations and uh, difficult conditions. So thank you for coming on last minute. And we're now ready for our photo. So let's unite our voices together across many continents. So free Alex Saab, free Alex Saab. 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 Free Alex